Good evening, Biology 400 people. This is Mr. Gales, and tonight we're going to go through energy and organism screencast session number three. This screencast is going to focus on the functioning of enzymes, which are special biological catalysts that increase the rate of reactions. Before we get started, please make sure that you have your two-column note paper and you're ready to take notes. Uh, as we talked about in class, please make sure that you're looking at the underlying terms as your main ideas. They will go on the left-hand side of your notes. And then on the right-hand side, you're going to write in definitions, key ideas, examples, diagrams that may seem necessary, and of course, any questions that you have as we move through this presentation. All right, our first main idea for this screencast is enzymes. At the end of the last screencast, Mr. Workman talked about how uh, reactions can, or, or the rate of reactions can be increased by using something called a catalyst. Catalysts will increase the rate of reaction by reducing down the amount of activation energy required to make the reaction work. Enzymes are special biological catalysts. They are protein molecules that serve as catalysts in cells. Uh, enzymes are really unique. There are thousands of enzymes because every enzyme is specific to a particular substance that it works on or a reaction that it drives. So there are literally enzymes for every kind of molecule that needs to be either built up or broken down in your cells. Every major reaction like cellular respiration in our cells or photosynthesis in the cells of a plant uh, are enzyme driven. Obviously the value of enzymes is they're going to make the reactions occur much more quickly. Um, there's in data to indicate that Enzymes have the ability to speed biological reactions up to about 10 billion times faster than they would occur without the catalyst uh, being present. The picture that you're seeing here at the bottom of the screen is a basic diagram which des describes essentially what happens when an enzyme does its job. We have here this large globular protein serving as the enzyme. In this case, the enzyme is called sucrase. Now, keep in mind this A-S-E ending. That'll come up a little bit later. Uh, the enzyme sucrase has a structure here called an active site. That's where the substrate molecule, in this case sucrose, which you should remember is a disaccharide, is going to bond into this active site. So the substrate and the enzyme are available and they come together, they bind together here, they form what is called an enzyme substrate complex. And then we have the addition of water. If you try to remember what is going on here, if we have uh, a larger substance and we want to break it apart into smaller individual substances, we need to add water into that. That's called a hydrolysis reaction. So we're adding water in and the substrate is, is going to be converted to products within that enzyme. In this case, the products are glucose and fructose. What's interesting about enzymes is the, the substrate is changed. We get different products at the end, but the enzyme returns to the beginning of the cycle uh, unchanged. It's not used up at all and it's not changed, so it's able to go through that series of reactions as long as there is substrate available. Now I'm going to jump out of this and go over to an animation here, which is a really nice animation that explains how enzymes work, and that'll lead us into the next slide. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions in the cell. A special region on the enzyme, called the active site, has a shape that fits with specific substrate molecules. An enzyme works by binding to one or more specific molecules called reactants or substrates. Binding occurs at the active site. The enzyme and substrates form an enzyme substrate complex. The interactions between the substrates and the enzyme stresses or weakens some of the chemical bonds in the substrates. These stresses encourage a link between the two substrates, leading to the formation of a different molecule. As a result of the chemical interactions within the active site, a new product is formed. The product is released from the active site, the enzyme assumes its original shape, and is free to work again. Although this reaction has specifically illustrated the formation of a single product from two substrate molecules, other enzymes catalyze the formation of two products from a single substrate. All right, so this animation goes through the basic information on how enzymes work. And there's a little practice quiz down at the bottom of this page. So let's take a minute and go through some of these questions. 
first of all, enzymes are, do we recall what kind of organic molecule they are? Take a second and see if you can remember. All right, enzymes are proteins, so we should mark that one. All right, which of the following binds to the active site of an enzyme? Is it water, product, substrate, any other enzyme, or none of the above? So what we're looking for here is what do we call the, the reactant that joins with the enzyme? All right, it's substrate. All right, which of the following correctly represents the mechanism of en enzyme function? All right, take a quick look at those. Remember, what we're looking at is the enzyme and the substrate will come together. They're going to form an enzyme-substrate complex. Then you'll have the enzyme and the product that forms, and then eventually you'll have the enzyme plus the product. So the best choice for that one is D. And an enzyme can only bind to one reactant at a time. Well, we saw one reactant join at the beginning of this reaction forming off two products, but the other kind of reaction can occur as well, where we have uh, individual, um, we, can, we can have, essentially we can either have two individual substrates coming in together and being bonded into one molecule, or we can have one molecule coming together uh, and being broken apart. So in this case, this one would be false. And then finally, the enzyme speeds up the chemical reaction in the cell, but can only be used once. That one is false. We know that enzymes can be reused. Okay, so quick look at how enzymes work. We're going to jump to the next slide and move on to the next main idea. There's a series of main ideas here. We're looking at how enzymes work. Now, when we look at how enzymes work, we need to understand that enzymes bind to very specific reactants. And when they do that, they form something called a complex. This notion that every enzyme binds to a specific reactant is called enzyme specificity. When we were studying organic chemistry, we did mention that uh, the three-dimensional shape of proteins was very critical in terms of determining their function. And it's that three-dimensional shape that determines the specificity of the enzyme. So you can see this picture down here. This is a, a molecular model of an enzyme called catalase. There again, there's that ASE ending. And it has a very specific shape. Only when it's in this shape will it actually function correctly. Okay. Next main idea is substrates. Substrates are the specific reactants that enzymes will interact with. So in this particular situation, this catalase enzyme has a substrate, hydrogen peroxide. So this enzyme catalase is specifically designed to work with hydrogen peroxide. We would say that hydrogen peroxide is its substrate. And then the next main idea that we need to look at is active site. Uh, the active site is a three-dimensional location on each enzyme, and that's the location where the substrate will bind. So when we look at this enzyme model here, here's the active site. This is where catalase will join together with hydrogen peroxide in this little three-dimensional uh, shape. The schematic model of the enzyme, I think, helps you to see that a little bit more clearly in terms of the shape, the way that the substrate and the enzyme fit together. Sometimes this is referred to the lock and key model of enzyme action. You can see that the substrate and the active site seem to fit together kind of like a puzzle would fit together. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about the basic workings of enzymes. We have the enzyme with its active site, the substrate that it works on, and when they join together they form that complex. This diagram again shows us kind of the, the typical um, progression through an enzymatic reaction. We have our enzyme with its active site, We've got our substrate molecule. In this case, we have one larger molecule. Uh, the substrate and the enzyme will bond together in that enzyme-substrate complex. During that time, what occurs is the bonds that hold that substrate together are weakened sufficiently so that they can break apart. And at the end of the reaction, notice that the enzyme has not changed. It's the same all the way through, but the substrate is broken apart into two distinct products. Okay, so enzymatic reactions would be our next main idea. This is the general formula for an enzymatic reaction. We saw this on that practice quiz question. The enzyme plus the substrate will react together to form the enzyme-substrate complex. During that time when the complex is together, when those two substances are joined together, 
that's when the bonds are either going to be weakened between uh, within the substrate or the bonds could be the, the two individual substrate molecules could be joined together tightly so that bonds are facilitated. So depending on which way the, the uh, reaction is moving, uh, we'll have different actions within that complex. And then at the end of the reaction, we have the enzyme left over and, of course, the product that forms. Now, a specific example that would be worthwhile for you to learn about is that catalase enzyme. Catalase serves to break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And this is really useful for us because hydrogen peroxide is toxic to our cells, even though our cells produce this chemical as a, a normal byproduct of aerobic metabolism. In other words, breathing in oxygen and burning up carbon, uh, glucose, uh, hydrogen peroxide is a, a typical byproduct. So we have to have a mechanism in order to clear this hydrogen peroxide from our cells. We happen to have an enzyme called catalase that's produced in our bodies and it's found in our blood. So when catalase comes into contact with hydrogen peroxide, they form the complex. And when that occurs, what's happening is the bond that holds the hydrogen peroxide together is being weakened. And at the end of the enzymatic reaction, catalase is released to react again. And the hydrogen peroxide has been broken down into water and oxygen. Uh, this picture down here at the bottom shows a catalase reaction occurring with hydrogen peroxide in a petri dish. This is a type of agar called blood agar. It's a, essentially a, a medium that contains blood and so therefore it would contain the enzyme catalase. When you apply hydrogen peroxide to it you can see the bubbling that occurs. That's the release of the oxygen gas that's uh, made available as the uh, hydrogen peroxide breaks down. Now, if you've ever had a cut on your finger and you've used hydrogen peroxide to clean that, you've probably noticed the bubbling that occurs. That's because the catalase enzyme is in your blood, and when you put the hydrogen peroxide on there, it's essentially breaking that hydrogen peroxide apart into water and oxygen. So it's essentially you, you're using that to clean out that wound. You're getting water and, and in directly into the site of that cut. And the thing you're doing is you're producing bubbling, which will sort of help to clean that cut out. All right. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Uh, the, the, if you recall, we talked a little bit about the lock and key uh, model of enzyme action where the substrate seems to fit perfectly into the active site of the enzyme. Uh, more recent uh, research shows that we actually have something that would be called an induced fit model of enzyme activity. So it, generally, the idea is very pretty much the same. We have our substrate molecules that join at the active site, uh, but when the complex forms, what occurs at the active site is the enzyme will actually fit a little bit more tightly around the particular substrate molecules. Uh, that, that induced fit, as the substrates come into the active site, it induces the enzyme to wrap around those substrates, and it's that real tight bond that appears to be either breaking, breaking the bonds that hold the substrate together or uh, facilitating the formation of those bonds. Okay, so I'm going to jump out of this and take you to uh, an animation that we'll talk a little bit about induced fit so you can see that. We're going to go back over here to this tab. Uh, this is a really great animation from Northland College and we're going to look just at the first part here on enzyme basics. All right, enzymes are proteins that serve as catalysts. They speed up or slow down reactions, but they remain unchanged. We have the active site, that's where the substrate binds to the enzyme, and then there's generally also a regulatory region that can be found on a typical enzyme. Uh, we're not going to address that right now, but we'll talk a little bit about that in class. Okay, each enzyme acts on a specific substrate. We talked about enzyme specificity. The substrate is the reactant that that enzyme is going to act upon. All right, induced fit. If you notice here what's going on, uh, the substrate induces a more complete fit of the active site around it. The enzyme seems to sort of shape itself around that particular substrate. And when it's doing that, that real tight fit that it has helps to either, again, break the bonds between the substrate or to facilitate the formation of those bonds. Okay. Catalytic cycle begins when the substrate enters the active site. In this example, we're looking at a substrate called lactose. In this case, the enzyme is lactase. Lactose is milk sugar, by the way. So this is the enzyme that breaks down 
milk sugar into galactose and glucose. If you happen to be uh, lactose intolerant, that means if you drink milk you get uh, bad cramping and gas pains, that means you're, you're either lacking entirely or partially this lactase enzyme. All right, the products, uh, after the enzymatic reactions occurred, the products are released and the enzyme remains intact, ready to accept another lactose molecule, so the cycle can continue. All right, so I'm going to get out of that. We're going to go back down into presentation. And our next main idea is looking at how enzymes are named. Now, you may have already guessed that enzymes are going to have the ending ASE. We saw catalase, we saw lactase, those were two examples. We saw sucrase. Uh, so enzymes are named by taking either the name of the substrate or the action performed and adding the ending ASE to that. So a couple of examples for you here. There's an enzyme that's involved in the replication of the DNA molecule called DNA polymerase. What this literally means, this is the enzyme that's building the DNA polymer. Uh, when we study DNA replication a little bit later in the year, you'll see how DNA polymerase works. Lactase, we just talked about, this is an enzyme that breaks down milk sugar. And then we have ligase. Ligase is a, a commonly used enzyme in biotechnology applications. This is an enzyme that can actually uh, form bonds between uh, different groups. For instance, ligase is actually used in DNA replication and it helps to join together the bonds of the uh, phosphodiester, or, I'm sorry, the, the sugar phosphate backbone in the DNA molecule. All right, our final main idea for enzymes uh, tonight is factors that affect enzyme action. And if we look at these two diagrams carefully, you should see that there are two major factors that, that can affect the way enzymes work. One of those would be temperature. And every enzyme has an optimum temperature in which it works. Now, they're going to have a range of temperatures. Um, so you can see here the optimum range of, or the optimum temperature for this particular enzyme looks like it's somewhere just above 40 degrees Celsius. But it will operate within, a, a, you know, a range of temperatures. By contrast here, we have an optimum temperature for an enzyme from hot springs bacterium. This is a bacteria that lives in hot springs. This is another example of uh, an enzyme that's typically used in uh, bio biotechnology applications called Thermus aquaticus or TAC uh, enzymes. These operate at very high temperatures. They have an optimum range uh, up above 70 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then the other factor that can affect the way enzymes work is pH, uh, the pH of the cell. You can see that this is two particular enzymes that will be involved in breaking down proteins in the human digestive system. We have pepsin and trypsin. The optimum range for pepsin is somewhere down here between 2 and 3. That makes sense because pepsin operates in the stomach and we know that the stomach has a fairly low pH. Trypsin, on the other hand, has its optimum pH, uh, optimum uh, rate of reaction when the pH is somewhere between 6 and 7. Trypsin is found in the uh, first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. Okay. So every enzyme is going to have its own particular substrate that it works with. That's called enzyme specificity. And every enzyme is going to have its particular range of either temperature or pH in which it will work best. All right, that wraps it up for this screencast on enzymes. Uh, make sure that if you have any questions that you write those down in your notes and you can bring those into class with you. And the final screencast for this uh, unit will be on different kinds of reactions, overall reactions that occur in living things, either building things up or breaking things down. And we're going to talk about that cellular energy currency that you learned about called ATP. So until next time, this is Mr. Gale signing off, and I'll see you in biology. <laughs>